My name is Ashley Clark. I'm going to be talking about my story as a prostitute for 20 years. I have two older brothers. The earliest memory that I have of them abusing me, you know, molesting me, was about five years old. We were living in California. All three of us was in the garage and my oldest brother was sitting on a bench and my other brother was standing beside him. He actually went to close the door and my oldest brother that was sitting down, he just took his pants off and just happened to place my hand on his genitals. He told me just to imagine it as me sucking my thumb. I ended up squeezing my hand as hard as I could and then I ended up screaming and I ran outside, ran inside to the front door to my grandmother's bedroom and told her what happened. She came out, yelled at both my brothers and that was it. That's the earliest I remember and it went on until about early teenage years. I think the latest memory Marie was 12, 13 years old. It was actually with my other brother. I immediately, you know, told, I'm very vocal. And that's what I did. I told my grandmother, I told my grandpa, I told my aunt, and they just, you know, swept it under the rug. And basically I was raised on what goes on in this house stays in this house. I just assumed that was a normal thing for all families. Shortly after like the last incident that I remember, like I said, I was about 12, 13 years old. I ended up meeting my first crush. He was about, I think, either 19 or 20 years old. We talked over the phone for a couple weeks. Our initial plan was just because I was so young and he, like I said, he was about 19 or 20. Our plan was for him to come over and say that he was 17. We did that initially. He had came over. We, you know, told both my aunt and uncle that he was 17. I ended up going to the restroom and by the time I came out, he had already told both of them his real age, like I said, 19 or 20. And they was okay with it, which was very uh, shocking to say the very least. And that was actually the first time that he ended up raping me. So I was actually sitting on the futon playing a video game and he came down to sit beside me. He ended up forcing you know, himself on me and I was a virgin at the time. I remember telling him no numerous times because I was scared. I was a virgin. He ended up forcing me on the ground and basically taking my virginity. He left shortly after that. As soon as I could hear the door to the garage open. I went upstairs, my aunt was in the kitchen. I told her what happened and she told me to just go upstairs and take a shower and take a hot bath and relax and get ready for school. So that's exactly what I did. I took that as, okay, well, she's not making a big deal about it. Then maybe this is what boys, you know, this is what they do to girls. I would say it was probably a month, maybe not even a whole month after that, when I started prostituting myself. There was this guy that I had met over the internet. He was about 22 or 23. He was from New York. He came down and we went to the movies together. My grandmother, she met him. He ends up going to the bathroom and I you know, follow him a few minutes after that, we end up going to into the handicap stall, the bigger stall. And he just did stuff to me and he gave me $20. So I had it in the back of my mind that, okay, well, this is what I can do. At first I was meeting guys online and that went on for, I would say about five or six months. And then I found out I was pregnant. I remember going to the doctor because I didn't feel well at all. I was actually on the depo shot. So I was on birth control. A week after I was raped, my aunt took me to the doctor and uh, got me on the shot. And I also do want to make it clear too that the man who raped me, I was still talking to him every now and then after the incident. He would come over to my aunt's house, like our house, almost every single day while I was at school. And I never put two and two together. But um, yeah, he was having, you know, sexual relations with my aunt as well the entire time. Once I found out I was pregnant, I was about seven and a half months along. And I find out that I'm pregnant with a you know baby boy. I was devastated, but my aunt and uncle seemed like they were happy about it. After I had my son, I went to school about maybe three and a half weeks later and she was watching him. I wasn't, you know, a, a good, a good parent. I wasn't a good mom. I was 14 and I never changed a baby's diaper before then. I've never fed a baby. I never even held a baby before I had my son. A few years later, I, about a, 
a week or two after my 18th birthday, my aunt, she was always constantly recording our phone, like my phone conversations. She overheard a conversation that I had with somebody about wanting to move out. My initial plan was, you know, to take my son with me. Like he's not going to just stay there. After she heard that conversation, she got mad and she ended up calling CPS, Child Protective Services, saying that I was not taking care of my son and I was on drugs. The very next day, I came home from school and there was two caseworkers. I don't remember one of them's name, but the other one was Natalie. She drug tested me and came back positive and she took my son. So I was in jail for a week. I went to court on a Friday and it was a juvenile judge. He sentenced me to go to a foster home so that I could graduate high school. And mind you, I was 18, so I was an adult and that's exactly what happened. Shortly after I was raped, I was prescribed after I allowed my son's grandmother to take care of him, I signed over my rights and everything to her. I started popping pills. This whole entire time I was prostituting. It started with pills and I ended up quitting high school. I ended up getting my GED a few months later and I started nursing school. A couple months into going there, they taught us how to, now back then, I don't know how it is now, but back then you could call in narcotic prescriptions. It just depends on like what scheduled they are. So after I found out that I can call in, that's what I did. I started calling in for myself. First I started with Vicodin, then and then I went to the patches and I would suck the gel out of the patches. Shortly after it got to that point, that's when I had my aunt telling me that there was a sheriff there looking for me because I had warrants out and I ended up getting caught at a pharmacy. At this time, I was pregnant again with my oldest daughter and they ended up taking me to jail. I got sentenced in one county to a mandatory seven years. So I still had other counties that I had to go see what my fate was with them. They allowed me to have all of my county time with ev even with different counties to count toward my seven years. So I did a, I 15, months of jail time credit. So I did a little under five years actually locked up in a facility. I did my last year. So technically like a little under four years in prison. And then last year was in a halfway house. Went to the halfway house. I started prostituting about a month into being there. I started popping pills again. I ended up getting raped and kidnapped while I was in the halfway house. During the lunch break, that's when I would prostitute. I wanted, you know, cash money. So, um, one of my trucks ended up picking me up and we ended up doing our thing. And by the time it was time to drop me off, he just kept driving. And I'm like, well, you know, my stop is right, right here. What are you doing? And I went to reach for the door handle and there was no door handle. He had him driving to a secluded area. It was past downtown. It was like nothing but storage areas everywhere. And he raped me numerous times. I was trying to fight back. I had marks all over my face. Shortly after I was released from the halfway house, I ended up getting pregnant again with my other daughter. Then I ended up meeting my ex-husband. I met him online and we got married shortly after we met. We got married in April. I became pregnant again shortly after that. We were married for five years and I was prostituting the whole time. He didn't work, he didn't do anything, so I had to pay the bills and I had to do what I had to do. I ended up filing for divorce in March of 2017. I started using everything. And it was one of the darkest moments of my life. In April of 2017, I was arrested. I stayed there for 30 days at the time may have possibly go to different car lots and was test driving cars and not taking them back. I ended up getting caught with a, it was a felony, Grand Theft Auto. I ended up going right back to jail and then I had to do another prison term. I had, to, had a year to do. So during my year in prison, it was probably the hardest year compared to the mandatory seven that I had to do because this time around I had five kids. I get out October 12th of 2018. I immediately started using an hour after I got out of the prison van. I ended up meeting my now wife. I met her initially online and I actually remember 
seeing her for the first time a year before then when I was in county. She was in county too, but she was in a different pod than I was. It was actually December 16th of 2018. And I remember this date because I ended up overdosing that night. This time was different because I saw like my grandmother and my mom and they're both dead and that scared the out of me. So it literally scared me straight. My wife ended up narcaning me. I told her like, I have to change, man. Like there, I just cannot continue living my life like this. The very next day, it was five o'clock in the morning. So it was probably like a six hour span. I ended up walking to the clinic and getting home. So I struggled with addiction for 20 years. I prostituted for 20 years. I did a total of eight years total in, in prison and numerous years of probation altogether, probably the majority of my adult life. In 2018, when I got out of prison, that was the first time that I've never had any ties to the state, like no probation, no parole or anything. So when I told my family when I was younger, you know, about the molestation with my brothers and stuff, it wasn't until actually in 2018 when my one of my older brothers got his own daughter pregnant that I ended up getting, you know, an apology from my family. Well, for my aunt. Let me just say that for my aunt, um, my grandmother had already passed away at this this point. But then it came out after that apology a few years later that she actually had relations with with him when they were younger too. So like incest was like a big part of my family. That was one of the main reasons why I didn't want my son, my oldest son around as well. I started talking to my son after I was released from prison in 2018 for about a year. And then like he just stopped messaging me up out of the blue. I ended up Googling his uh, name and uh, found articles him being arrested for killing somebody. He went to jail and he actually just got sentenced, I think a few months ago to 25 years, but he has to do a mandatory 18 years. His dad actually, he's actually serving a mandatory 10 year sentence now for molesting and drugging and raping. I think it was four little girls under the age of 13. I always tell people that always listen to your kids. Always listen to any kid that tells you like this is happening, that's happening. Even if it sounds so bizarre and so crazy because there something is going on. Like no kid is just going to say, you know, that their brother is molesting them. Their brother is touching them in places that, you know, they shouldn't be touching. Even though like I truly feel like my grandparents did the best that they, they could with what they had. It's still different, you know, like I didn't have, I had a connection with both of my grandparents, but it wasn't like a motherly or, you know, a fatherly kind of like how it would be if my parents were here. I just wish that somebody would have, you know, believed me. I just feel like, if, you know, if um maybe if somebody believed me, then maybe I, um not maybe, I would have probably taken a different path. You know, when you are basically being told that, you know, you're a liar, this didn't happen, or, you know, you're over-exaggerating, you know, it makes you feel like you're not worthy. And I have changed and I am no angel in my story. Like I have done so much it to a lot of people and, you know, to my aunt included, you know, to my family included. I know my aunt isn't the same person that she once was when I was growing up. And I don't want people to perceive her as that. My daughter, she's 17, she'll be 18 in a few months. And uh, I told her, I don't want you reading my book because she has a, um, well, she had a relationship, you know, with my aunt, with that family. And I don't want what happened with me to ever have any influence over their relationship. Because again, my aunt is not the same person today as she was then. She's still struggling with demons, but I feel like that's all because of untreated trauma that she never got help for. And I feel like, you know, just like the saying, like the, you can't, teach an old dog new tricks. I feel like th that's just where she is at in life now. So I would say like the worst of my addiction probably was in 2017. I was with somebody who introduced me to, 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 to the pretty much. And I became pregnant. I was still using when I was pregnant and I ended up having a miscarriage when I was like four and a half months along. And I feel like after that miscarriage, cause I've never had a miscarriage ever before. I feel like that took me, that just 
put me in a real, real dark place. And shortly after that, I ended up, you know, going to jail. After I was released from jail, I obviously started, you know, using again. My very first overdose, I remember I was staying with my um, boyfriend at the time, his mom's house, and he came back with, you know, my, my stuff, the hair and I didn't even inject it. It was powder and I believe it was mixed with fentanyl in it. I literally just did a teeny tiny little line. All I remember is right after I did that line, I remember waking up to him. I, I was completely soaked and he was smacking me on my face and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, you, you know, you were gone. Like you weren't breathing, you were turning, you know, gray. And he's like, I had to, you know, pour, you know, cold water on you. And I had to, you know, I was smacking you and everything. And you just want to wake up. This is how like sick addiction is, you know, immediately after I woke up, that's when I, I said, okay, well, where's the stuff again? Like I want to, you know, and I did, I used it right when I woke up after an overdose. The health problems after addiction, I'm trying to think, I really don't even have a lot of health issues. I feel like my issues stem from all my traumas of prostituting. And um, after I got clean in 2018, I was still prostituting until like, I think maybe March or April of 2019. So I feel like quitting prostitution was more of, it was a lot harder for me to quit prostitution than, than addiction. I mean, I was born in chaos, you know, like when my mom, my biological mom gave birth to me, she was in prison herself. You know, she died when I was 18 months. And you know, there's my whole life was nothing but chaotic before I even started prostitution. So when I started prostituting, it was like, I felt at home. I felt at, you know, peace because it was always like a chaotic, fast paced lifestyle. And that's what I was used to. So when you go from living that lifestyle for so long, for 20 years to living the life that I have now, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the life that I have now, but it is boring as hell. You know, there's not a lot of chaos going on. There's not a lot of anything going on. So like the highlight of my day is you know, my kids and their school activities, which I, I would rather like have it like that than nothing else but it is a it's a process <laughs> it's a journey and i still struggle i struggle with that than i do with addiction today i still struggle with the thoughts of going back out there and you know living that living on the edge you know chaotic lifestyle than anything so i'm 37 years old you know i wrote two books i never in a million years would ever imagine my life being where it's at today. So I started TikTok just like everybody else during the pandemic. I have 1.8 million followers right now, which is crazy. I started telling my story with just like weird, quirky, you know, music, you know, little dance videos. And um, I'm talking about, you know, addiction, talking about jobs, talking about Dave. If I would give any advice to anybody, any person that's struggling, any woman or any man that's struggling with the lifestyle that I lived for so long or, you know, custody issues or anything of that nature, it does get better. When you start living life on your terms and start living life how you're meant to live it, everything will start falling into place.